third panelist for today is Bob LaSalle Klein. Bob is currently a visiting professor of pastoral ministries at Santa Clara University, while on sabbatical from Holy Names University, where he is professor of religious studies and philosophy and chair of the religious studies department. He is a co-founder and began his family with Lynn, his wife, at the Oakland Catholic Worker, which serves immigrant families. He and his wife are the parents of three children. Bob did his dissertation with John Sabrino and recently published Blood and Ink, Ignacio A. Correa, John Sabrino, and the Jesuit Martyrs of the University of Central America in 2014. You can see the cover of that book projected on the screens. Orbis called this book the definitive account, and Kevin Burke describes it as sweeping in its scope, unsettling in its political and historical implications, and profound in its theological depth, end quote. Bob's sabbatical projects include the spiritual writings of John Sabrino, published by Orbis, and early works on Jesus the Immigrant, Contextual Christology, and the Signs of the Times. He has done three edited volumes on Contextual Christology, Orbis 2011, The Galilean Jesus, a special issue of Theological Studies in 2009, and The Thought of Ignacio A. Correa with Father Burke in 2006. He serves on boards from the Instituto Hispano of the Jesuit School of Theology, the Region 11 Seminar on Formation for Hispanic Ministry, the Oakland Catholic Worker, and he is a consultant for the graduate program in pastoral ministries at Santa Clara University. He has daughters at Santa Clara and Seattle University who participated this summer in university-sponsored service projects in El Salvador and Ghana, Africa. Bob, it's really wonderful to have you here. Bob's going to be holding the mic, and you'll see him standing closer to this screen as he takes us through this presentation. Thank you for coming, Bob, very much. What a joy, really, it is to be here with you. And I have so many old friends uh, sitting here throughout the, throughout the crowd, people who have walked together through this journey. I guess maybe Dean Brackley's our, uh, our, our leader, right, of our little group, but who have walked, you know, with the Salvadoran community in different ways. And it's really blessed us and blessed our lives. So it's really great to be here with you and to, and to, and to tell a little bit of the story. I guess I'm the next generation from Sicilia because my grandparents immigrated, my wife's parents immigrated. So my father couldn't write a complete sentence and here I am with a doctorate. And you know, I was raised pretty much by the Jesuits and I guess, you know, our generation's asking where today can we find contemplation and action with a sacramental and prophetic imagination? And where do you find that today? You find it in those who find Christ in the poor and who have, as JVC says and Dean like to say, have let their hearts be broken and their lives be ruined. That's where we find a sacramental imagination with a prophetic twist. So memory and hope, the legacy of the Uka Martyrs, a Jesuit university for a crucified people. So, a word on my encounter with the people of El Salvador. I could say a lot about these slides, but let me just say that this is the story of a refugee family who survived the Rio Lempa massacre, came to the Catholic worker, met my wife and I when we were young. And I was sitting on the couch of the front room of the Catholic worker, and Carmelo Zavala sat down. And the year is 1987 a year after I left the Jesuits, looking to be a contemplative in action in the real life of U.S. foreign policy at the place where a fifth of the population of El Salvador had immigrated to the United States. And Carmelo is sitting there and he says to me, I'm here because I had to flee. He says, one day I was coming home after the Rio Lempa massacre. We went to Honduras. Then we came back to El Salvador. They harassed us. They murdered us, and one day I was coming home, and my brothers came out from my house, and they said to me, you can't go in. Well, my children are in there. My wife's in there. No, you can't go in, because they murdered your wife. But I have to see her. Carmela, they have dismembered her body in front of your children, and your children have fled, and we're looking for them. Last week, Carmelo was with me 
at the Open Catholic Worker, distributing food boxes to families, 300 families from all over the, the neighborhood. He's still there. He's part of our community. What Carmela did was he took me by the collar, and he grabbed me, and he said, here, Bob, here. This is where you will define what it means for you to be a contemplative in action. I will be a part of your life. And if you turn away from me, you will be corrupted. And if you look at me and you see me for who I am, I will bless you and I will give you life. And that's what history does to us. It grabs us by the collar and it says, here, not there, this place, not that place it could have been, not that degree you could have had, not that life you could have had, this is the one. Take the opportunity or not. But here's the invitation. So, a few years later, November 16, 1989, the martyrs were killed. And I had already met John Sabrino because he had been up to the Bay Area a few times and I had the privilege of hosting him, driving him around. And John is very generous, you know. He helped us raise money for the open Catholic work. And I can tell you some funny stories about um, crazy Catholic workers <laughs> trying to get John Sabrino to do things. But he was always generous and he did them for us. Uh, and, and so I knew him a little bit. And then the martyrs died. And, and by this point, I'm, just, I'm doing a doctorate. And a couple of years later, I go to him and I say, John, I'd like to write on your Christology. Would you work with me? He probably doesn't even remember this. But again, life grabs you by the collar. And he said, well, Bob, you know, OK, I'll work with you. But I don't want you to write about my work. And I was like, well, John, you know, like, I'm doing Christology, right? You know, I, I have to do Christology. And he said, no, I want you to write our story. I want you to talk about Korea. I want you to tell about what we did. And I'm like, well, geez, you know, I mean, like, that's kind of my career, right? I mean, I'm going this way, and you're pulling me this way. So again, I'm sure he doesn't remember this, but for me, it was a turning point. And, and I went home, and I thought, well, okay, you know, I'll walk through that door. That's an invitation. I'll accept it. And little did I know that I would be invited into a community of scholars and friends, that, that, that an international community that would help me tell this story. So, just a couple of points, because we only have a couple of minutes, and we have a moderator who warned us that we better keep it short. <laughs> so, what have I learned? I learned that an epic-changing revelation took place at Medellin of God's preferential option for the poor. We often think of that option for the poor as like an ethical thing, like, you know, we should do it because most of the planet's poor. But that really isn't the point. The point is that God makes a preferential option for the poor. And the key meditation, the spiritual exercises, is the Trinity looking on the world. And we're invited to be God's hands. We're invited to get on board, and that's what discernment's about, is looking for God's. Uh, action in the world. And at Medellin, they saw, well, God's making a preferential option for the poor, and he's doing it now, and he's doing it in history, and he's grabbing us by the collar, and he's saying, here, now, this place. So Gaudi Mespes says, okay, you go home and read the signs of the times, and you interpret them in light of the gospel. All the bishops go home, Latin America, in, in the basement of the, of the Vatican, in the catacombs, you've got Dom Hilder Camara planning Medellin already. And so Medellin says, in the words of Puebla, which was the next conference, that God is calling the church to, con is calling for a conversion on the part of the whole church to a preferential option for the poor aimed at their integral liberation. Okay, so then the Central American Jesuits send a postulata to the 32nd General Congregation in 75. And what comes back? Well, now this becomes a mission for the whole society of Jesus. What is it to be a Jesuit today? What is it to be a companion of the Jesuits today? What is it to work in a Jesuit context? It is to engage under the standard of the cross in the crucial struggle of our time. There's a crucial struggle in our time, and you can get on board or not. But the struggle's happening with or without us. The struggle for faith and the struggle for justice, which it includes. So, but there's another level to this. And Archbishop Romero comes along, and he shows us that the crucified people are the body of Christ. 
Now, I'm going to get myself in trouble here, as I sometimes do. But I go to Mass a lot. And, you know, real presence is real for me. But, you know, these priests just stare at the Eucharist, you know, forever and ever. I think to myself, well, the body of Christ is sitting right in front of you. I mean, this is the body of Christ, but the body of Christ is sitting in front of you. And, and what Medellin is telling us is that we're all the body of Christ, but if you want to find Christ, especially the crucial struggle of our time is here in front of us. Turn and look, and you will see Christ. You don't have to go on a retreat. Get, go out in the neighborhood, and you will find him there. Contemplate him where you find him. So Romero says, uh, and these are not just metaphors. Romero says when he goes to Aguilaras three weeks after Rutilio Grande is killed, you are the image of the pure Savior, who represent Christ nailed to the cross and pierced by a lance. And you are the image of all those towns who, like Aguilatus, will be broken and defiled. And he's not just talking to them as an individual, but as a people. Your organization, your neighborhood, your family, it's the body of Christ. So Aya Korea, with his genius, seven months later, on February 1978, he thinks of John Sabrino's dissertation on uh, with Moltmann. And Moltmann has the famous book, The Crucified God. And with his genius, he takes Ea Correa's words and he forms them as a riff off of The Crucified God. Instead of The Crucified God, well, where's God? We already said God is in the crucified people. Therefore, let's talk about The Crucified People. This is a Christological image. It's weighted with, 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 with all the weight of, of, of the mystical insight that Christ is in the poor. So Aya Korea says, the crucified people, seven months after Romero, the crucified people are the vast portion of humankind that is literally crucified by historical and personal oppressions, February 78. And then in 81, not only that, but they are the principal sign of the times, by whose light all the others should be discerned and interpreted. And so, John writes later, this kind of starts a pattern. Once you go down this road, history grabs you by the collar, pulls you off your chair, and turns you into a different person. And so Romero, he says, became somebody very special for you, writing to Ea Correa, touching your deepest fibers, for which you said, with Monsignor Romero, God visited El Salvador. Each of you was given a Christian and a Salvadoran torch, and you kept it burning. Monsignor Romero received it from Otilio Grande, the night they killed him. And once in, when Monsignor Romero died, you picked it up. The torch is being passed, but let's try another image. The Holy Spirit is being passed. The Holy Spirit has been given to Otilio Grande by the people because he encounters Christ, What's the Holy Spirit? It's the Spirit of Christ. They encounter Christ, they give him the Holy Spirit. He passes it to Romero, who then raises a prophetic word. And then he passes it to Romero. It's a chain of witness, just like John's Gospel. Now, I'm going to throw one more idea out. I'm going to suggest that they died as collateral damage in the United States packed with the devil. These are not my words. These are the Pentagon's own words. I found a Pentagon document stating this. So briefly, the UN says the roots of the Civil War lied in land, land tenure problems, patterns. Violence had formed a part of the exercise of official authority in El Salvador for 150 years. Well, the Reagan administration comes along and, and, and looks at the war and says, well, look, the FMLN insurgency will be the most important Cold War conflicts in Vietnam, drawing the line in Vietnam. You remember this cover of Time Magazine, Alexander Haig? He got himself elected on that stuff. It's a political campaign in part for Reagan. He's going to draw the line in El Salvador. In 84, the Kissinger Commission comes along, and they, and they give it a nice face. And they say, well, we're going to make aid dependent on progress on civil, human, and democratic rights. Unfortunately, most people miss that there was an end note in that document. And in the end note, it says, the survival of the Salvadoran regime is crucial to American security, and the U.S. will not allow human rights to stop support for the El Salvadoran government. In other words, it rendered the whole document meaningless. And of course, we found that was true. 
And so looking back, the Rand Corporation did a report for the Pentagon in 1991, evaluating its own history. And it says, quote, during the 1980s, the Salvadoran government, the right-wing landowners, and their allies, and the Salvadoran military knew they had America trapped. Where have we heard that phrase before? I mean, we keep doing this over and over and over again. They had America trapped. And that the U.S. was prepared to make a kind of pact with the devil to in ensure that El Salvador not fall to the FMLN. Now, let me just suggest to you that we've used image of Christ. And I want to say that they believed it. I mean, it wasn't just a metaphor. They actually believed that Christ is in the poor. Well, let me suggest to you we have another metaphor here of evil. You know, there's a mysterium salutis, mystery of salvation, but there's a mysterium iniquitatis, too. And the United States has been caught in the mystery of evil. And it doesn't require your whole heart and soul. All it requires is a little cooperation. And we got ourselves caught in the mystery of evil. And we continue to be caught in this mystery. And it will claim us, and it will grab us, and it will make us do things that define us. History grabs you, and you make your choices. And the mystery of evil is alive in our land. However, God has chosen the poor to save us. God has chosen the poor to save humanity. So, John suggests in his Christology, the disciple who responds to the grace-filled invitation from Carmela Zavala, or whoever it is, who responds to the grace-filled invitation to take the crucified people down from the cross, will become a living sign of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. In other words, what would it look like if we lived as though we actually believed in the resurrection? What, what would we look like? And also a sign of the sending of the Spirit and the ongoing work of the Trinity in the world. So out of this dynamic comes a new idea for a Christian university. I would argue the most important advance since Newman. So Aya Korea says in 85 when he gives honorary doctorate, Uka gives honorary doctorate to Romero, he says the ward represented a commitment to do in our university way what he did in his pastoral way. How to run an institution like the archdiocese from the perspective of a preferential option for the poor. That's John's comment later. So in 79, the Uka says, we seek to be an institutional university response to the historical reality of the country in a university manner with a Christian inspiration. Notice how that mimics, we will discern the signs of the times in light of the gospel. It, it mimics it. We're going to respond to reality. We're going to discern the signs of the times. But we're going to do it in light of the gospel, with the Christian inspiration. But how do we know if Loyola Chicago is, discerning, is, is doing it in light of, of, with a Christian inspiration? It's not how many chapels we have on campus or how many masses or how many retreats. All those are good and they're tools. But the purpose is made clear here. When the Yucca said in 79, the most explicit testimony of our Christian inspiration will be putting ourselves really at the service of the people in such a way that this service allows itself to be oriented by the oppressed people themselves. This is the advance on the idea of the university. This is the defining mark of a new kind of university. So that's why I say it's the most important advance since Newman. And Acrius says, what's human intelligence for? Right? We're supposed to be smart people. Some are smarter than others. Um, I'm not, uh, but I, I, you know, we get to be in the presence of people who are smarter than ourselves, and we get to be in the presence of people who are learning to be smart. And Acrius says, human intelligence is first and foremost a sentient and practical biological adaptation to the demands of reality. A species of idiots is not biologically viable. Its primary end is not to uh, is understand and grasp meaning, and that's what we've heard a lot from Europe, that it's really about grasping meaning. He argues that's not what it's about. It's to apprehend reality and to confront ourselves with reality. And it does it by grasping what's at stake, assuming responsibility, and taking charge or transforming that reality. Now, that's just intelligence. And what makes a Christian? Well, the Christian university can only do this 
can only fulfill its mission by taking stands on the crucial issues of our day. That's the only place to go. We have to be involved. If we're going to be intelligent, if we're going to be intelligent as Christians, we have to take stands inspired by Christian values on the crucial issues of our day because they grab you by the collar and they force you to take a position. Silent, in favor, against. So that uh, so that's a change in society, so that it reflects the hopes and aspirations of all of humanity, especially the poor. So, a couple final thoughts. Where are we today? Well, my friends, half the planet's poor. And by the way, they're migrating. No, we got about 7.1 billion people on the planet. 19% are living on less than a dollar a day. 48% on less than two dollars a day. Almost one in seven are migrating. 740 million internal migrants and 240 million international migrants. The planet is poor and it's moving. Climate change is a looming crisis for the poor. The developing countries will suffer 99% of the casualties attributable to climate change in some predictions. This is a study done uh, for the African countries that show that the Millennium Development Goals, which by the way aren't doing so well anyway, will be further compromised by climate change. And the mean surface of the temperature of the planet is, is growing. We can pretend it's not happening. But the effect on this beach is not going to be nearly as great as the effect of the beach in, in beaches in Africa. Because we've got money to protect our shores. So, where do we stand as Jesuit universities? Adolfo Nicolás gave us a great vision. And here I'm coming to the end. So, you know, you could say, well, Bob Lassau Klein, who's he? He's nobody. But Adolfo Nicolás said in 2010 to all the Jesuit president, uh, presidents of universities from around the world, he outlined a vision. And he asked the question that I'm asking today. What kind of universities, with what emphasis and what direction would we run if we were refounding the Society of Jesus today in today's world? What would our lives look like if we really tried to be contemplative in action? And we believe that the action is in the struggle for justice and the struggle for life of families around the planet today. What would we look like and what would our institutions look like? Well, he said, Jesuit universities would clearly bear a common responsibility for the welfare of the entire world and its development in a sustainable and life-giving way. In other words, we have to come up with plans. We have to f figure out how to do this. And we have to denounce where it's not being done. That's one. Second, we should be like the yucca. And this is important. Because, you know, we can have these celebrations over and over again. You know, and it's great. But frankly, the point is what's going on now. Remember, the spirit was given to Romero was given to Rutilio Grande. He passed it to Romero. Romero passed it to Rutilio Grande. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Romero passed it to Ea Correa. And Ea Correa, he's passing it to us. It's given to us. So the question is, what will you do with this Holy Spirit? And he said, let's make every Jesuit university what Ea Correa called a proyecto social. Move, so that moved by its commitment to the service of the faith and the promotion of justice, that's GC32, it, it seeks to insert itself into a society, not just to train professionals and make more Catholics, but in order to become a cultural force advocating and promoting truth. We talked a lot about truth yesterday with John. Virtue, development, and peace. And so I end here with our friend Dean Brackley, who's a friend to so many of us and in some ways represent our little North American troop here. Um, I, I said in the introduction of the book that he's sort of one of the godfathers of, of this book. And I'm, I'm going to quote, John, forgive me for, for uh, doing this, but I'm going to quote John. And I happened to arrive on the last day of Dean's novena. And John pulled me into his office. And he said, Bob, 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 come here, come here, look at this. I stayed up all night. He says, I never stay up all night, but I stayed up all night to get this out for Dean's, you know, for the last day of Dean's. Homily, and he pulls out these words, and I, I, I just can't tell you how moved I was. Because this is all of you, too. All of you who have given so much of your time and your lives to this. For, uh, Dean, in some way, I think, represents all of us. All those who let themselves be grabbed by history and, and to do something important. John writes, 
In Dean Brackley, God passed among us. For me, there is no greater confession of faith than to say that God continues to visit our world. It is my deepest experience of faith how God is present in human beings, women and men, young and old, Salvadorans, and yes, North Americans, who, by the way, made a pact with the devil against El Salvador, who were involved in evil things in El Salvador, and North Americans, martyrs and believers. Now, Father Dean was not crucified, but he lived to the end actively participating in the crosses of this world. And he worked hard with strength and energy to take the crucified people down from the cross. So you can see Ayaku. This is, you know, he does this yearly letter. So you can see Ayaku. We are content. You all, Julia Elba, Selena, John Cortina, Father Ibisate, and now our beloved Dean. It matters. That word beloved matters. It mattered to Dean. It matters to me. It matters to all of us who love Dean. Our beloved Dean Brackley have been with us. And through each of you, God has been with us. One couldn't ask for more. And if you could give, bear with me just one more sentence. I'm going to tell you the story of my last conversation with Dean. So Dean had come up. He went to Berkeley, you know. Um, C. Prevet tried to get him, you know, set up with cancer treatment. It didn't work out. So he went down to Las Gatas. He was there for a couple of weeks, and then he went home. So I went down to see Dean. And I would always stay with Dean when I go to Salvador. And, and so I go in, I say, you know, friends conversation. I said, Dean, man, it's amazing what God's done through you. I mean, you know, all the people who, who God's touched through you, you know, it's, it's really amazing. All the, everybody seems to know you. You've told the story. You, you've nurtured so many lives. You know, you've, it, God's done a great work through you. And he goes to me, God's good. But Bob, you know, Frankly, I just got lucky. I go, well, what do you mean? And he goes, well, the guys died. I put up my hand. They chose me, and I had 20 great years in El Salvador. And I go, well, that's true, Dean, but God can call, but we have to say yes. And he's tired, and he's kind of laying back in his bed, and he just put his hands like this. And, you know, he had that always a wry smile, right, and a little self-deprecating. And he just said, digo sí, señor. That's our invitation. Thank you. So to conclude our formal remarks for today, I want to uh, introduce Father John Sabrino. He obviously requires no introduction. I suspect many of you were at last night's event. Father, we are honored, humbled, and made hopeful by your being with us today. It would be hard for us to describe what a joy it is to have you here uh, with this university community. So thank you for your generosity in being with us. And with that, the floor is yours. Well, it's not generosity. I don't... It is not generosity. There is no other way out for me. I came from El Salvador. They asked me to, to be with students. Yesterday I gave a talk, and now with... Uh... You said to conclude. That made me, uh, you understand me, I am tired, as you might realize it, but anyway, I will talk. So, oh, and before I forget, I'm a happy man. Huh? All this is true, all was true, awful, huh? and we'll go into that, but I don't regret having been in El Salvador. I do not. Huh? Okay. So, comments. I don't even know if I can read what I wrote, <laughs> but I'll try. Uh, and the first thing that occurred to me, <clears throat> listening to you, uh, I won't go into, in general, into what you said uh, directly. But the first thing I want to say, I studied <clears throat> uh, theology seven years, uh, four years plus PhD and so on. St. Georgen, that's Germany. Okay. Uh, in from 1966 to 73, I I heard <clears throat> a lot about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You know who he is. And uh, professors told us that Dietrich Bonhoeffer had uh, said in Latin that we should uh, live, act, and so on. Etsi Deus non daretur. Even if there was there wasn't such a thing as divinity, okay. Why do I mention this? 
took me to left. I, I, I like people from San Georgan. No? It took me to leave San Georgan to learn that this is von Heffer was killed. No professor ever told us that he was killed. A martyr was something else. Huh? In Audium Fide, was something else. In Audium Justitia, he wanted to get rid of Hitler. Huh? But why am I saying this? Uh, uh, it's not so obvious uh, to talk about people who have been killed. Huh? And uh, later, well, later, I said, why on earth is that so? Huh? That nobody mentioned Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And by the way, other Jesuits, German Jesuits and Polish Jesuits who were killed. Huh? Many, many, many. Why is it? Well, it's understandable. Uh, being killed means uh, well, something awful. And, but what made me is two things. Being killed is not an exception. Huh? Being killed so uh, violently and certainly not being killed out of hunger is not an exception. Huh? Should be the normal thing. And for us Christians, well, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, I say when I am tired and ironical, didn't die at the age of 80, surrounded by grandnephews, and, you know. Huh? Yeah. So, uh, if, whatever, whatever, martyrs, whatever you want to call them, huh? people who died out of hunger, huh? if they are not um, important for us, uh, we have missed the point. Maybe we have not missed some other points. I'm not being, uh, hopefully, I don't want to be... Uh, Pessimistic? No, no, no. But the point we have missed. And by the way, by the way, I, I, I think I said it yesterday so that nobody feels bad. Huh? I was born, uh, I lived close to Loyola. But Ignatius wasn't killed. Uh, he was sick, he suffered a, a lot, he worked a lot, uh, but he wasn't killed like Jesus. Huh? Why do I say that? Since I am so tired, I have the freedom to say awful things. Huh? <laughs> and one of them was, uh, this is awful. Uh, the Son of God came to the world. Huh? And then the world didn't uh, go well. So God decided to send Ignatius of Loyola. Huh? You see the irony, right? <laughs> it's irony. And I'm, I like him very much, Ignatius. But I think Ignatius, I, I said yesterday, I like the word Ignatius. The adjective Ignatian, oh, I'm not so... Uh, you might have Ignatian spirituality, administration, Ignatian administration, many things. Well, in other words, going back to Frankfurt, nobody told me that this is Bonhoeffer about whom we heard and learned a lot and with profit, huh? but that he was killed. That's the, now, the, my second comment, uh, I think four or five comments like this one. Uh, what is uh, Dan? Contemplative in, 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 contemplative in action. I think that was a great uh, insight of Ignatius of Loyola, really. So that's it. And, uh, now, we humble men from the third world, uh, well, not me, by the way, add contemplative in the action for justice. That's all. Yeah. And many other actions, but for justice. Yeah. And can we be contemplative in the action for justice? Well, I, I think so. But it is important, it is important. Uh, it's not just to put together, and, uh, and you understand me correctly, it's not just to put together two human dimensions, contemplating, contemplating, and action. It's not, how do we put these two human, uh, these two dimensions of human beings together, well, being contemplative in action? Uh, yes, but not any action helps contemplation. Huh? You might contemplate how to become a millionaire. 
And I'm serious. And many people, as you know, are very intelligent and use their heads and contemplate a lot, whether God or whatever, to become a millionaire. So to put together these two dimensions of human beings is nothing especially new. But of course, Ignatius has something else in mind. And when we talk in El Salvador, uh, in the action for justice. And in the same way, I read the whole of Carl Ran I think the whole, not impossible, but a lot of Carl Rahner when I studied theology, because it was a little bit, for me, uh, boresome. Boring. Aburrido? Aburrido. <laughs> boring. For, boring, boring. For me, okay. Although my first, my first <coughs> theology pr professor was Ratzinger. Ratzinger was at Tübingen, and he wrote very, very good uh, texts, one of them on the church. That was my introduction to theology, and I liked it anyway, but then Ratzinger changed. But, uh, <laughs> well, he changed. I mean, I'm not saying anything new. He left Tübingen. Huh? Okay. Uh, so I read Runner and Runner and Runner. I, I like Runner, and, and especially be, besides liking or disliking people, I'm very uh, thankful to Carl Run. And I talked to him when he was old, and for the first time I think he understood that something was wrong in Latin America. Yeah? Before that, well, it was uh, okay. So, Carl Runner is always quoted, and I do too. And I think some of you have quoted. Uh, in the future, uh, either you are, you say, a mystic, or you are not a Christian. Okay, we understand that. I, I. Now, Casaldaliga, who is 86 year old, a bishop from Brazil, he is very, very <clears throat> old and sick. He said, in the future, either you are poor, poor. No, that's not a problem, <laughs> the large uh, percentage of humanity. Either you are poor or in solidarity with the poor or you are not a Christian. So what I'm trying to say, I think Rainer said it very well and Casaldaliga said it very well. But usually people quote and know Rainer, I understand that. But people don't know and don't quote Casaldaliga. That's why I wanted to make that comment. Let's quote both. Now, uh, another comment I wrote down. The Good Samaritan. Uh, the Good Sa well, it's uh, obvious. Uh, compassion, mercy, uh, we have written also about that. Uh, but let, let me, what did the Good Samaritan do? Helped a victim, helped a victim. But for whatever reason, Jesus didn't say, uh, didn't say the whole thing at one moment. For whatever reason, the Good Samaritan didn't go after the, uh, the what? The victimizers, no. He helped the victim, fantastic. Huh? Now, however, not however, in Mark, Chapter 3, at the beginning, uh, in the last of the f of five controversies of Jesus, the story is told that Jesus went into a synagogue on Saturday, so he did everything wrong. Huh? Why go in on Saturday synagogue and help some other man who was a good Samaritan? But what happened? Pharisees and the Herodians. Herodians must have been the, uh, the state police of uh, King. Were uh, expecting what happened, and when Jesus ended up healing the man of uh, how do you say it? Uh, With their hand. With their hand. They come together to eliminate Jesus of Nazareth. So what am I saying? You understand me. The Good Samaritan is a good human being. And I hope that all of us are good Samaritans. But Jesus was not only good Samaritan. Huh? They went after him, huh? and they wanted to eliminate him. Now, why do I say that? In, to, to, uh, 
They, in other words, uh, martyrs are uh, real human beings. Huh? And now, one more thing, I think. Or, no, two more things. One more thing. Had God has failed to you? <laughs> that a crazy question? Does it make sense? No, or you don't know? Well, I don't know. I don't know God that well as to know. Huh? What am I, but what am I saying this in such a maybe, maybe, um, mm, how do you say this? With strong words. Well, uh, you know, uh, I think it's in Genesis chapter 6, around in the beginning, when God went mad. Look around. It was all mythology, but that's uh, not important. He looked around and said, <laughs> what a failure, my creation. What a failure. And he said, I'm going to do away with it. Huh? And then the, the fall. Huh? I don't know if we think about those things. Well, after all, it's mythology. Well, so, there are so many mythologies, but some we like and some we don't dislike. God was not happy. And he said, I regret having created human beings. That's correct. Huh? Uh, not only, I regret that. I'm going to eliminarlos, eradicate them from earth. That's what, that's what the text is. Well, and then Noah and why do I say this? That was not the last word. Whether mythological or not, that's not the issue. That wasn't the last word of God. He said, no. I will save human beings. I will try to be with them. And now, with the permission or not of Jürgen Moltmann, I will suffer with them in history. Huh? God's suffering. What, what does he do? What does it mean that God suffers? The same thing as what he, it means that God is happy. It's human language. Huh? But God decided to be with us in history, suffering with us. Uh, well, that's what they want to say. So, we live in a world of uh, martyrs, of uh, well, the, the figures that uh, Bob Lasalle has offered. Huh? To be a Christian, to be a believer, or what, how you want to put it, it means that we still walk on in history. Huh? And, and God, God suffers with us. And then Moldman will say, I wrote my dissertation, I told you, on Jürgen Moldman, and I forgot because uh, uh, do we suffer with God? But this idea, this idea, yesterday I said it in <laughs> the last words of uh, the movie Casablanca, uh, is siempre queda París. Uh, there is always left for us, uh, for us, uh, to walk in history with God. Uh, suffering, oh yes. Uh, PhDs, we will know. How many? God knows. A scholarship, God knows. Uh, but it is always possible to walk in history, huh? suffering. And as I said at the beginning, I don't think a Yakuria yes, was a, a sad human being. And certainly not Amando. A Yakuria was more intelligent than Amando. But Amando was more human than a Yakuria. I'm sorry for the uh, intellectuals. Huh? <laughs> uh, Amando was not a suffering human being. Neither was uh, Julia Elba and Celina. No? We can walk in history. That's all I want to say. Huh? But, so. And the last thing, and this has to do with a Yakuri. Um, well, uh, what's his name? Uh, Bob Lasalle knows a Yakuri much better than I do. And probably he knows more than I do about myself. Because <laughs> no, really, I, I, I'm, I'm old and my memory is uh, gone. But there are a few things I remember of a Yakuria. Uh, I don't think so, but anyway. That's not my last comment. A Yakuria, uh, for a Yakuria, 
the Yakuya was a philosopher, I studied with Tsubiri, a, a great philosopher, uh, studied with Karl Rahner, a great theologian, and so on and so on. And I think Yakuya had respect for Tsubiri and Rahner, but to some degree he could, he didn't talk that way, but that's my understanding. He could consider himself a colleague of Suvidi, a colleague of Runner, and then it's for you to decide who was more intelligent, Runner or Yakuri, I don't care. But uh, he could con consider himself a colleague. Yeah? But he met uh, Romero, Archbishop Romero, and in, in, in Greek, of Se. Romero let him uh, reveal himself. Rom uh, Eliacuria appreciated Romero very much, very much, that I know, very much, but he never considered a colleague. Romero was something else. Zubiri was more intelligent than Romero, you know, and Runner, no, that's not the issue. Huh? But Romero was something else. And why? That's my understanding of things. Because Romero was a human being for whom God was real, huh? real. And uh, why do I say that that impressed Yakuria? And I will try to give feeble arguments, but... Yakuria wrote a letter. He was in Spain in exile, Yakuria. Romero had been uh, <coughs> appointed Bishop of El Salvador. A month later, as, as it always happens in El Salvador, somebody was killed, uh, Rutilio Grande and two peasants. So, so. And Romero uh, acted in a really um, surprising way. Ejacuria was in Spain, and three weeks after the killing of Rutilio Grande, Ejacuria wrote to Romero a wonderful letter somewhere else. Oh, I got it. I don't know who stole it from the Archbishop office. And I said, uh, Felix Culpa. And I published it. I made it public. It was, uh, uh, but really, I mean, I didn't ask permission to anyone. Because it's the obvious, the obvious thing to do. Uh, and Ejacuria says, first in, in Spanish, He visto en usted el dedo de Dios. I have seen what you have done. El dedo de Dios, uh, the finger of God. Huh? Is that a metaphor? Yes. But he didn't say, Yacuria, I have seen in you a good prophet, that would be good. Huh? El dedo de Dios. Then, after the, the death of uh, Romero, Spanish journal, Salterre, asked Yacuria to write a, a piece, eight pages, on Romero. And Yacuria wrote, as Bishop Romero, enviado de Dios, para salvar este mundo. Yeah. He didn't say again, well, a good prophet, or a good Christian, or a good Jesuit. No, no, Romero was not a Jesuit. Although he made the spiritual exercises, 30 days. Uh, and before that, when he, when Romero was killed, and we celebrated the funeral mass at the university. Then a few days later was the funeral mass at the um, square in front of the cathedral, 100,000 people. Bombs to honor Romero, who had been killed. Uh, bombs exploded and killed. Nobody really knows how many people, maybe 30, 40. And most people, those who died that day, was not so much because bombs exploded, but because they wanted to uh, hide into the cathedral huh? or uh, other buildings. But it was so packed and jammed of people that some people died because they couldn't breathe. Well, okay. So uh, let's go back to the university, the mass. And Romero, uh, and Archbishop Romero, he was the president, el rector, and he had the homily. I forgot, uh, as it happens, uh, many, many things. But this I, I didn't forget. Con Monseñor Romero, Dios pasó por El Salvador. Huh? 
with S. Bishop Romero, God uh, uh, Paso came to visit, uh, walk through El Salvador. What am I trying to say? At least in, in these three occasions, and by the way, Yacuría was not the spiritual type, no, no. But in, at least in, he spoke, he wrote on Romero very, very many, many times, uh, a prophet and so on, a good archbishop. But he brought into relation Romero and God. Whether it's the finger, whether it's the uh, el enviado, uh, whether it's uh, the sacrament of God. Uh. Now, uh, does that have to do with martyrs? Well, those are words of a martyr, Elia Curia, about other martyr, Romero. No? Uh, so, uh, martyrdom brings good things. And I am, as I said, uh, I think I said, I don't like, I don't know whether you say it, but I, I, don't worry if you do. Elia Curia y compañeros mártires, I don't like that. Ella curía y compañeros profesores, maybe, good. Huh? But you don't have a martyr and then other martyrs. Huh? Nobody knows Elba, no, Celina, Amando López. I don't like that. Huh? I mean, I don't like, I dislike it. Huh? Uh, but anyway, uh, talking about these people, huh? on, on the one hand, it's serious, uh, we kill this, huh? It brings something good, at least to me, huh? to see how a martyr, in this case, a curia, because I was closer to him, huh? but whoever would have said that, to read or listen from the words of a, a martyr, talking about another martyr, that brings some sort of joy. And I think there is one more thing, but fortunately for you, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> all I'm going to say, so what do you do, what we all do, uh, is uh, uh, walking history. Uh, with the suffering God. Huh? Okay. <laughs> Wait for the uh, joyful God. Maybe I, I don't know the, the mystics, men and women. I don't know. I'm not one. Huh? But with a suffering God, at least with a God who is... Son, huh? whose sacrament, whose expression on earth have been Jesus of Nazareth and as we show Romero. Huh? Walk with them, let's walk with them, and the whole thing will make sense. What will happen to Chicago University? I have no idea. What will happen, what will happen to the UCA? Don't think the UCA is a part of heaven on earth. No. Huh? And that I know very well. What will happen? We don't know. I don't know. But they know that walking with God, as Micah said, huh? Mike, yeah. What's all about? Practice justice. Love tenderly and walk with God in history. Thank you for listening. <clears throat>